uh, channel for lots of conference chatter. Uh, for those of you that aren't, aren't on it, I highly recommend it. Um, and for those of you that are on it, you get to see how bad or good your talk is given the chatter on Twitter. Uh, it's been a great uh, professional resource. Um, the person who's leading this work is Robert Brucker. He's my graduate student, now postdoc. And uh, it's my pleasure to present uh, his work entirely on this. Okay, so I want to begin by starting with uh, that this will not be a typical speciation talk. In fact, I want to wipe the floor of speciation genes, which tends to be a big interest in the field, and talk about speciation microbiomes, which I hopefully will convince you can be a big deal if we can get more people interested in this topic. And so I present this quote. Uh, it is a rather startling proposal that bacteria, the organisms which are popularly associated with disease, may represent the fundamental causative factor in the origin of species. Now, will we go that far today? Certainly not. But the guy who predicted this is named Ivan Wallen, and he published a book in 1927 with this quote in it called Symbionticism in the Origin of Species. Now, Ivan is famously known for being the mitochondria man because he, in fact, predicted that mitochondria are derived from bacteria uh, based on their binary fission process uh, under cellular observations. And so with that observation, he reasoned that bacteria could be fundamental units in evolutionary change. Unfortunately, Wallen got swamped out by H.J. Muller's radiation genetics work in the same year. And so we found that organisms are hypermutable based on radiation genetics, and a lot of those mutations, if not all of them, map to nuclear chromosomes. And Wallen's prediction about symbiosis being very important in evolution was suddenly a, a put in a backdrop, a veil to nuclear genetics. And of course, in 1937 comes a very famous book in evolutionary biology, Dobzhansky's Genetics and the Origin of Species. Note the title of Dobzhansky's book, Genetics and the Origin of Species. Essentially, he might have stolen Wallen's topic, replaced genetics with symbioticism. And we all know Dobzhansky's book. We don't know Wallen that well. Dobzhansky sets the foundation for the species concept. He sets the foundation for the dobzhansky muller model of incompatibilities. I'd like to um, convince you today that perhaps Wallen had some stuff to, to bring back to life and revive. And part of that relates to the fact that in the last five to 10 years, the microbiome has taken off um, in an exponential growth phase. So this is just Google web search trend from all over the world and basically shows that over the last uh, five to 10 years, there's been this incredible growth in people wanting to learn about the microbiome by just punchy, punching in that search term. Um, you'll note that it's starting to get going right around the Human Microbiome Project, a pivotal moment in, in setting the importance for basically the microbial communities that live inside uh, animal hosts, plant hosts, etc. So what we know today is, is uh, certainly something that evolutionary biology has to confront. Um, and I think we have a long ways to go. So this is a schematic of a human, obviously, and it shows various partitions of the body as if it's a landscape in and of itself, each with its own microbial communities often specific to the bio ge bio geography of the host, of the human. Now, the human genome has something like 20,000 plus genes in it. If you take the genes from the microbiome and you total them up, we're talking about 8 million genes that have functional significance, potentially, to the human uh, body. And that's a hundredfold greater genetic diversity than the nuclear genome. Now the question that we have to confront is something called the hologenome, which is whether the total information of the microbiome in the genome is a unit of evolution, a unit of selection, and one that we have to understand together in major evolutionary processes such as speciation. Now clearly the microbiome is known as uh, being adaptive because when humans get disease, such as inflammatory bowel disease, this has been associated with the microbiome going awry. Uh, respiratory diseases as well, and even the way a baby is born by C-section or vaginal delivery affects their initial microbial community because the skin and the vaginal canal have different areas or different microbial communities in those areas. So these are diseases, right? But what about evolution? What can we say about how the microbiome is structured over time periods across, say, speciation events? <clears throat> so the model that we've been thinking about in my lab over the last four years or so is called this um, this sort of hologenome model, where if we start with a common ancestor that has both a genome and a microbiome, could we perhaps understand that as a speciation event proceeds, we get some onset of reproductive isolation, and speciation is complete not only because the nuclear genome diverged, but because the microbiome diverged as well. And are these epistatically interacting compartments 
of the whole genome, if you will. Ultimately, if these species were to interbreed, as we all know, reproductive isolation can start to be a problem and hybrids can die or become sterile. <laughs> and just slowly get into that joke, because that's like the only joke. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. Appreciate it. Um, so we've been looking at this question in Nasonia, uh, and what we found, um, is, and we published this last year, is that if you look at the phylogeny of Nasonia, which is a parasitic wasp, it's basically the second best genetic model uh, in insects next to Drosophila, and it has great uh, 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 variation in closely related species, this is a phylogeny of three Nasonia species, their ages of divergence, and then an outgroup of their, their below fly host that they parasitize. Turns out their microbial communities, if you map the relationships of the microbial communities, you also find that the relationships of the microbial communities parallel the evolution of the host, genome. Now we're not talking about sequences like an end of symbiont co-diverging. What we're talking about are community clusters. That is that X percent, let's say 90% of the microbes here are shared with this species here, but then these two only share 50% of their microbes with this next, next species down here. That cluster analysis reproduces the phylogeny based on the genome. So we've been thinking about this as, if this is the phylogenetic signal, then potentially there is a phylosymbiotic signal that could be widespread and has not been surveyed in a large number of taxa yet, yet we find convincing evidence for it in Nasonia in its developmentally staged. The larvae have a different phylosymbiotic group that show the same relationships. The pupae have a different microbial community that show the same relationships in the adults and so forth. It's quite remarkable uh, that this is, this is the kind of stuff we're funding because we normally think about the microbiome as permissive, maybe even environmental, and shouldn't have this kind of stability to it. Okay, so one of the sort of most intensely studied things in Nasonia over the last decade has been this F2 hybrid lethality in the study of the genetics of speciation. And if you cross Geralti and Vitropenis, these species that diverged about a million years ago, what you see is the parental species on average produce about 40 offspring per cross. When you do the interspecific crosses and produce the F2 hybrids in both uh, hybrid directions, we see a decline in, in, in viability with the larval stage being the most pronounced stage of developmental uh, viability, and the larvae die in these F2 hybrids. So here's a, a healthy Nasonia larvae, and here's an inviolable larvae. First difference, of course, is the melanization, that darkened reaction of the larvae, is kind of important, because the melanization response is often linked to an inflammation response, in which melanin actually encapsulates pathogens and tries to protect them from the host. So this is one reason why we think the microbiome might be important. This is a second reason because we see this phylosymbiotic pattern. So when we produce hybrids, what happens to the microbiome? Never mind the genome at this point. The genome stuff is, as I said, has been ongoing for 10 years. Remarkably, uh, we have five chromosomes in Nasonia. We have genetic markers, QTLs, foreign viability linked to four of these chromosomes. There are cytonuclear interactions known. The genetic landscape for this trait is very uh, uh, well defined as a genetically based form of hybrid lethality. Yet, if we look at the microbiomes of these larvae, what we find is this is the older species pair, Nasonia duralta and Nasonia vitropenis. And predominantly in the larvae, there's one species called Proteus and other species called Providencia. And then every other bacterial species we just lump into the screen group for the purposes of this talk. Now, these, sequence, these uh, taxa are identified by 16S ribosomal sequencing. When we make a hybrid, something fundamentally different occurs in which the hybrid microbiome is different than either parental genome. So not only do we perhaps have genetic breakdown, but we now have a microbiome breakdown in these F2 hybrid larvae that we know to be dying. As a control, uh, we also looked at the larval species between uh, the larval microbiomes of Longicornis and Geralta. They are closely related. They diverged about 400,000 years ago. They do not show hybrid viability, and as a result, we find that their microbiomes actually look like one of the parental species that they're derived from. So we have this association where if you die, your hybrid microbiome is different than the parentals, and if you do not die as a hybrid, you have a microbiome that looks like one of the parentals. So this is association. Can we do a causal experiment? The causal experiment is quite simple here. This is our hypothesis. Gut microbiome, probably in conjunction epistatically with the genome, causes hybrid mortality. 
So of course, in a non-hybrid Masonia, it lives in a conventional hybrid, meaning it has its microbiome, it dies. In a germ-free hybrid Masonia, which is the crux of our experiment, we predict that if the microbiome is causal, we can rescue this mortality by removing the microbiome. And finally, we should be able to recapitulate the lethality by inoculating in the microbiome back into these germ-free hybrids, thereby showing causally that the microbiome is assisting this hybrid mortality. So it does this happen. So here's the conventional data that Rob generated. Uh, this is just percent survival. Um, there are four crosses. The parental crosses are on the uh, outer bounds here. So pure Giralta, pure Vitropenis. We get about 80% survival from egg to uh, pupation. The hybrid genotypes down here are shown as a significantly reduced uh, percent survival because indeed they are inviolable. So about 80 to 90% of these hybrids die. Germ-free, the sort of eureka moment for this experiment was all of a sudden now we create this, uh, these hybrids, the same F2 genotypes, right, as these, but we see significant increase in their viability and they're actually not statistically different in this experiment to the parental viability. Note that the parental viability did go down because a, uh, a microbiome is required for, for proper development, but the key here is that it's still quite high and the hybrids have essentially been rescued from this genetically determined uh, mortality, or so we thought. Right? And then we do the inoculation, and here we take a, a few species, not the total microbial community. So we take Providencia and Proteus bacteria. And we put it back into the hybrids, and we're able to recapitulate some of that significant F2 mortality that occurs in Nusonia. So this was uh, pretty remarkable given the backdrop here that people have been sort of chasing down what are the QTLs and genes that cause hybrid mortality, and yet if we just cure the microbiome, these QTLs probably are no longer in play because there's no hybrid mortality. So we wanted to test that. Um, so what we did is we looked at genetic markers that are linked to the QTL regions on the chromosomes. And we generate these F2 hybrids by, of course, doing parental crosses. We make an F1 hybrid, and then we collect the F2 male hybrids, which show typically that mortality. Now, if there was no mortality, there would be Mendelian inheritance, and every allele would have a 50% frequency in the F2 hybrid. But because there's mortality and certain genotypes die and others don't, we get what's called a marker transmission ratio distortion. Essentially, allelic variants are no longer showing up in the viable F2 hybrids because they've been linked to death. So when we look at candidate uh, QTL uh, markers, uh, chromosome 1, 2, and 4, you can see that in the conventionally rare larvae, and then in the, um, actually this is from previously published data, this is from data that we had redone in the lab, we find good correspondence that there's a marker transmission ratio distortion such that the V allele is overrepresented on chromosome 1, chromosome 2, and then it's underrepresented on chromosome 4. Now, when we cure these hybrids of their microbiome and rescue lethality, we rescue the marker transmission ratio distortion that has essentially generated these QTLs, showing Mendelian inheritance of these alleles into the F2 hybrids that should have been dying. So fundamentally here, we have some linkage between the microbiome and the genome that is perhaps evidence for the whole genome. And that's kind of a controversial term right now because we don't have a lot of evidence for it. But those of us in the microbiology field keep finding reasons to keep looking for this intimate connection between the genome and the microbiome. As part of that, we're interrogating what the gene genes, okay. We're interrogating what the genes might be. I'm gonna skip past this slide and do a summary. So uh, first of all, species have both phylogenetic and phylosymbiotic signals. Um, hybridization disrupts the microbiome. And finally, hybrid lethality requires the microbiome and the genome in order to get um, the, the trading experts. I can stop here and take any questions. Yes. Are you just extracting like the whole animal to get the whole genome? In this case, we're. Uh, I'm not sure what you mean by that. In this case, we're focused on the gut microbiome. Okay. Not, not any microbiome. Okay. Gotcha. Gut or yeah. Yes. Um, how do they transmit the gut microbiome from you know across generations? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, transmission probably happens maternally from a deposition of feces to the growing larvae, but then consume the mother's microbiome. It's more like a mammal. Right? That's right. It's kind of a smearing of maternal microbes from the feces.